I recently finished my playthrough of Control, and for a while afterwards I thought about this game a lot, particularly how it made me feel and why it made me feel that way. You could call it horror, but as we all know that is a very broad genre. And even though Control utilises a couple jump scares and some disturbing enemy designs, it doesn't use the most fear inducing tool that a lot of horror games do, the feeling of vulnerability, or rather not in the way that they do. In a lot of horror games you don't have powers or weapons, and when you do, they're limited. Survival horror traditionally includes inventory restrictions, and encourages you to avoid enemies. And then you have the stalker subgenre, which renders you almost completely useless in combat against the enemy, with your only option being to hide. It's why I'll never find Left 4 Dead too scary, but shudder at the thought of alien isolation. In Control, your character is extremely powerful, especially once you upgrade your abilities and weapons. Because of this, survival isn't really that much of a struggle, so your gameplay doesn't make you feel vulnerable, and yet, something about the game did. Mark Fisher's book titled The Weird and the Eerie helped me understand the effect Control's atmosphere and lore had on me, and also aided me in understanding its difference from generic horror. He says the following, The major cultural examples of the weird and the eerie are found to be at the edges of genres such as horror and science fiction, and these genre associations have obscured what is specific to the weird and eerie. What the weird and the eerie have in common is a preoccupation with the strange. The strange, not the horrific. The allure that the weird and eerie possess is not captured by the idea that we enjoy what scares us, it has rather to do with the fascination for the outside, for that which lies beyond standard perception, cognition and experience. This fascination usually involves a certain apprehension, perhaps even dread, but it would be wrong to say that the weird and the eerie are necessarily terrifying. The setting of Control is perfect for feeding into the concepts of the weird and the eerie. Alternate dimensions, indecipherable entities, objects and environments can all serve this fascination with things that lie beyond our standard perception and experience. The highly organised Federal Bureau of Control dedicates itself to the effort of understanding these dimensions, objects and entities. The factual format of the research papers and case studies scattered across the oldest house try to make Control's world more logical in appearance, but the attempts of humans to comprehend and predict these unknown worlds are futile. For every object they capture, learn and think they understand, there will be hundreds more they don't. The difference between the weird and the eerie is that the weird is constituted by a presence, the presence of that which does not belong. In some cases of the weird, those which Lovecraft was obsessed, the weird is marked by an exorbitant presence. It's teeming which exceeds our capacity to represent it, very much like the board, who loosely interpret themselves to us by the presence of an inverted black pyramid. The eerie, by contrast, is constituted by a failure of absence, or by a failure of presence. The sensation of the eerie occurs either when there is something present when there should be nothing, or when there is nothing present when there should be something. This reminds me of the black rock bridges we see. These structures occupying what seems like an endless void make us question which one truly belongs, or if neither of them do. The collision or entanglement of these alternate dimensions with ours is what makes Control's world so weird. In comparison to if the whole game was set in the astral plane, for example, Mark Fisher illustrates this perfectly by saying, Lovecraft needs the human world, for much the same reason that a painter of a vast edifice might insert a standard human figure standing before it, to provide a sense of scale. By setting his stories in New England rather than in some far distant realm, Lovecraft is able to tangle the hierarchical relationship between fiction and reality. Similarly, the oldest house is situated in New York, a familiar locale, yet the internal structure is anything but. The breathing building, the oldest house, is a location containing other endless locations. It feels alive, and seems to even be able to suffer from diseases like the mold and the unwelcome hiss. It's a place of power, somewhere that acts under its own set of rules and even hides itself away from those who aren't aware that it's there. It only appears for those who are looking for it, which of course makes it a perfect place for the confidential nature of the Bureau and their work. I'm convinced that the janitor arty is a physical representation of the oldest house, or at least so in tune with it that the difference is indistinguishable. While Polaris led you to the building, 
it's implied that he's the one that actually let you in during the lockdown. He consistently refers to Jessie as his assistant, which would be fitting if he represented the oldest house, since he sends her on maintenance-oriented missions. He even seems to be able to read Jessie's mind as he responds to her thoughts. Ati the janitor is a friendly face in my book. Better than somebody with no face at all. <laughs> Think about it. No face. Perhaps he can peek into the minds of all the people in the building. The oldest house changes its portraits of the previous director Trench into Jessie's portrait instead once she is in possession of the service weapon. Or is it the board doing this? The board's presence is reflected in the oldest house by an inverted black pyramid structure in Central Executive, arguably the heart of the building. The board could be the ones who created the oldest house, or they could just be another inhabitant. It's believed that they are in the astral plane, so this structure might just be a kind of signal amplifier to allow communication. This anthropomorphic building has its weaknesses, which are called control points. The whole game is the battle between the Hiss and the humans, aided by Hedron, for control over the oldest house. When the Hiss have one of these points, the area around it is distorted and is illuminated by an infectious red light, highlighting the chaotic nature of its controller. We must take back these control points to return them to a state of peace and order, or at least illusory order. Without the control points, the oldest house would swallow us alive. We'd be sealed inside an endless labyrinth. No one would hear our screams. You suddenly see this dark void for the horror show it truly is. Filled with screaming fear we pretend to control. This belly of the beast is quite frankly a terrifying place to work, even without the hiss. Within the rules of this universe exist objects that do not belong, objects that possess personalities almost, and even powers. They're referred to as the paranatural. The fridge is kept under control by eye contact. Look away and it will kill you. Whatever else it is capable of isn't left up to chance, as the Bureau even implemented fridge duty to make sure it is kept under watch at all times. We don't see what happens to Philip. We hear a sound and he's gone, leaving only blood and a knocked over chair. The fridge continues to ominously stand idle on its stand. Sure, you're watching the fridge, but you feel the fridge watching you too. This disguise, a normal object in our lives, becomes invasive, intrusive, deceiving. A fridge is a homely object, but it's now a mask belonging to a malevolent force called the Former, a grotesque creature that speaks the same language as the board, but without understandable subtitles. It's implied that this thing was once a member of the board, and seems to be enacting violence and terror on people through altered objects. Sometimes altered objects are comical, like a singing fish that spews nothing but profanity. These beings from other dimensions have bled through time and space, invading the familiar. The Panopticon, the place where these objects are contained, is described as a temple, a place of worship filled with idols of angry gods. Humans are at the mercy of these entities. We perform rituals to placate them, just like we worship gods to avoid their wrath. What more are we than slaves to a fridge? Altered items. We've found many. They appear mundane, but nothing could be further from the truth. They are all powerful, dangerous. They press heavy on our minds because that's their nature. They've been altered because we can't stop thinking about them. We put them on altars because they're used to being worshipped. This keeps them calm. We contain them, but they don't want to be controlled. We study them to discover what makes them tick. These paranatural phenomena are affected by human thought, often responding to urban legends and folklore. For example, there's an object which simulated the behaviour of a werewolf, acting out the full moon protocols. We as people hold the key to controlling and containing these paranatural beings, but we just don't know how to use it. All we can really do is just seek to learn and perform their rituals. It can be difficult to distinguish between positive and negative objects or forces. They're easily recognisable objects, yet what they actually are is difficult, even impossible, to define. Our reality in this world has been compromised. Inexplicable forces and seemingly random appearances of terrors in the form of the familiar plague us with the feeling of the unknown. Nothing is predictable. The rules of this universe are meaningless now that we have been invaded by entities that don't follow them. All of this serves a feeling of cosmic or interdimensional insignificance. 
which is something Lovecraft utilised in his stories. He wrote, All my tales are based on the fundamental premise that common human law and interests and emotions have no validity or significance in the vast cosmos at large. The illusion of some strange suspension or violation of the galling limitations of time, space and natural law which forever imprisons us, and frustrate our curiosity about the infinite cosmic spaces beyond the radius of our sight and analysis. The immensity of spaces that the oldest house occupies are infinite and ever-changing. It can open gateways to other realms so silently, you might only know of its existence by stumbling into it by accident. Even the name of the oldest house suggests that this place, or being, far precedes us. Our character Jessie is insignificant in this sense, despite the illusion that she's in control. I mean, she is, to an extent, but on a much smaller scale than you might initially think. You are appointed as the director by the board. A special position, right? You should feel important, powerful, a comforting feeling for the player. But they were directors before you, and fate wasn't too kind to them. You wield these incredible powers, and yet you still feel hopeless in the sea of the unknown. The astral plane continues to exist, leaking into our world through everyday objects and even the hiss, which is likened to the quiet sneaking of a deadly gas leak. The board is one of the most mysterious entities in control. They're presented as a large inverted black pyramid that utters a strange language. I don't think this is literally what the board looked like. Their metaphysical existence is much more incomprehensible than that. So for us humans, they have presented themselves as a simple shape we can understand. Like the board, Polaris and the Hiss have also been translated into digestible imagery. Giving a physical body or appearance to these entities would make them less eerie. So instead they're represented by the red pulsing liquid and the pattern of light. These creatures, if you can even call them that, have the ability to invade our minds. The Hiss do so in a malicious sense, but Polaris is the opposite. It's hard to tell if any of these entities have a conscience, or if they instead follow a kind of instinct. Are there more entities that act as their god? How far does the hierarchy really go? Their unknown agency is also a factor which contributes to the eerie. As I've said, the board's existence is metaphysical, so they use objects of power to communicate from the astral plane. The hotline and service weapon are direct communications between them and whoever they have appointed as the director. The board are the ones who decide what objects can give powers to who. The board's language is translated to us in subtitles, which give multiple words in an attempt to translate into something humans can understand. It makes me wonder if the board even fully understand us. Jessie, as strong as she is, depends on the powers provided by the board. Despite everything, she is never the one who is in control. It's the omniscient presence of the board that dictates her actions and gave her this role, allowing her to wield the service weapon. Humans are like chess pieces being used by the board, Hedron, and the Hiss. We are at the mercy of these interdimensional entities. The aesthetics of control also contribute to the weird and the eerie. Dramatic lighting is heavily used within the game like the red light bleeding through shutters and creeping into the corridors of the infected bureau, giving us a sense of dread and urgency. This virtual space utilises light and colour in a way that makes everything so much more surreal. Areas dominated by the hiss glow a venomous red, and once claimed by Jessie they return to the calm, often monotone colour scheme of this morphing office building. Even without the hiss, certain colours are injected into this plain space, like the green leaves of the towering trees in Central Research. Our attention is drawn to this presence immediately, not only because of its scale, but its colour too. The lighting in some areas creates deep shadows, and god knows what could inhabit them, if anything at all. Either way, you're compelled to traverse these places more cautiously, because of this visual obscurity that equally creates a sense of trepidation. Quiet, isolated environments are intrinsic to the eerie. What should be a bustling office is laid bare, only with bodies suspended in the air. We are never shown the transformation process, the chaotic takeover of the hiss in these spaces. We are only shown the aftermath. The imagery alone puts the player at unease. The spectral, rainbow-coloured dust that moves around the hiss is hauntingly beautiful. Killing them results in an explosion of colour, which is incredibly hypnotic, just like the changing hallways of the ashtray maze, which will reject you until Artie gives you his cassette player. The monolithic structures of the quarry, the endless stretch of stars, the weird and the eerie can still be visually stunning. And perhaps this is what makes us feel so small. In the words of Fisher, there is no doubt that the sensation of the eerie clings to certain kinds of physical spaces and landscapes. Also, the lingering shots we see of some of the characters creates tension and mystery. 
There isn't a single character in the game we end up fully understanding. We can barely distinguish them between friend and foe at times. Where did the astral plane come from? How was it created? How long has it existed before us? What exactly is the board, and what are their motives? Speculations are intrinsic to the Eerie, and once the questions and enigmas are resolved, the Eerie immediately dissipates. The Eerie concerns the unknown. When knowledge is achieved, the Eerie disappears. In Control, you don't receive the comfort of an answer. You are left in an unsettling state. There are cracks in our reality that we can never seem to patch up. The world is so entangled. You no longer know what is weird, what doesn't belong. Everything simultaneously belongs and doesn't. The atmosphere is incredibly alluring. There is a good level of discomfort that doesn't inhibit the player's sense of curiosity. The weird cannot only repel, it must also compel our attention. So if the element of fascination were entirely absent from a story, and if the story were merely horrible, it would no longer be weird. This is exactly how I felt playing the game. A constant sense of inquisitiveness drew me into this world. It's most definitely Control's strongest aspect, that just on its own is reason enough to play the game. Our need to know and understand is what drives us. Just as it drives the Bureau, our hopelessness and insignificance in this world is what grips us with the feeling of vulnerability. But despite this, us humans, the ants of the universe, carry on fighting for knowledge and survival. We'll never know if our reality is more real than the others, or if the world of control is destined to be trapped in a storm of the weird and eerie for all eternity.